ground cover is a really good proxy for profit. It needs to be stable. So how do you get ground cover to be stable? This is what we do now. We do, uh, we do safe to fail trials or safe to fail practice areas. We're getting lots of information in. We're using sort of lots of feedback loops and measuring and stuff to then, and we can stabilize it. So this is, um, this has been through drought years through there, but it's not chasing extra production, it's chasing profit and landscape function and high well-being scores for the people. That's quite different, but it will work and it will restore the land. So this is the science. This was the work done by David Tongwe and Norm Hindley at CSIRO. They had to determine what do they have to look at to know if the land's going to erode at the next rainfall, is it going to infiltrate water, and is it going to cycle nutrients. So these are what they found. It's very similar. I liked it because it was very similar to MSA, to the meat standards for the eating quality. We went and kept measuring the carcasses, everything we could measure on them, and then feeding it to people and getting scores for that so that we could start to see the relationship. So a predictive model of eating quality. And some of the things that just fell out with like dentition doesn't relate to eating quality, it's ossification of the spine. And this is the same, if you want the land to be stable, it's gotta be covered. And I go, wow, yeah, we spent a lot of money for that. So, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but I don't meet a farmer that doesn't know that. I don't meet a gardener that doesn't know that. If you don't want the land to erode, it's got to be covered. But gee, there's a lot that pretend they don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Do you, you know what I mean? You can drive around in the south and stuff and everyone's ploughing up. Everyone's working soil. Everyone's grazing it back to the dirt. Everyone's doing it. So is it covered or not? So um, if you want it to infiltrate water, you've got to have this basal cover of perennial grass. Now this is grass plants that have got a base bigger than four square centimetres or two centimetres by two. And how many of them are there in each hectare? They've got to be mature perennial grasses. And what they found was that after four square centimetres, they tended to be around for a while. So what's the density on each hectare of those plants that are bigger than that, perennial grass. So it's about perennial grass. So perennial grass has sort of become the background music for people. I just, they're not interested in it. Everyone wants to talk to me about legumes and you know, chicory, plantain, everything except perennial grass. And I go, if you want to improve a perennial grassland, I think it's got something to do with the grass. Do you know, like, let's focus on that. And people go, what's he saying? You know, like, I go, geez, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? Yeah, so the basal cover of perennial grass. So those big based perennial grasses, those really big ones, they are like giant funnels for getting water into the soil. So, yeah, you know, they have that really big tops and they have a really big root zone. So they funnel the water in. So they also make sure that, uh, that it's stable and it's not flowing off. Then you've got a litter cover between the perennial grasses so that anything that falls between the grasses hits litter and then it slowly infiltrates into the soil and doesn't move uh, sideways across the landscape. And then surface roughness. I hadn't known much about surface roughness till day I started working with David Tongway. So they're really important. So soil cover is that's about stability and then basal cover of perennial grass for water infiltration. Down south, if the paddock gets too rough, we, we plow it up and re-sow it. And it's five years or so, the poverty years, um, uh, Andre Voison, Voison would say um, in his book, Grass productivity. If you re-sow a grassland, it takes about five years to get back up to speed. We set them back that far. So we need to know some of this surface roughness and ideally it's from those rough high bases of the perennial grasses. And then nutrient cycling. This is usually um, 
of great interest because it's about sort of how do we keep the nutrients cycling, the micronutrients and the macronutrients. And this is the combination. Again, the basal cover of perennial grass. So those plants that are actually feeding the root zone and activating all the life in the soil is what generates your nutrient cycle. So you've got to know that's the way carbon or sunlight is getting into the soil to activate your nutrient cycle. In a good grazing system, you do not need to add things if you're managing it for landscape function. They can stand alone. They always did. So we need to be thinking about that. Sorry. Just with your um, basal cover of perennial grasses, um, do, you, do you talk later in the presentation about density measures? Like what sort of density is, is what we'd be trying to achieve? Yeah. That? No, but I can now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That, that. <laughs> um, one, one of the things is Alan Savory says in one of his uh, um, podcasts that he hardly ever sees over 10% basal cover of perennial grass so and when he said it i went whoa because what we're measuring between 30 and 60 percent so at peter's place at naringla when he came out of the two and a half year drought he had 30 percent of each hectare was covered with the basis of perennial grasses and it's a quite a simple measure, sort of thing. You yeah. just run a quadrat and da 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 and ABCD sort of the type. So you've got a visual at 60%, you're putting, turning your foot sideways not to stand on a perennial grass or the leaves of a perennial grass. It is covered. You would say when you looked at it, oh, it's a hundred percent, but it comes out because you're measuring the bases and you've got to grab the bases. So 30%, you're starting to sort of, I can step, you know, which isn't a big step. The, um, I can step from plant to plant. 10% I almost have to jump, do you know, like to get from that. So it's some, yeah, like that's really rough. But if you've got, so if I can go like that and stand on two perennial grasses, you've got more than enough grass to regenerate any landscape. Theo. So not all perennial grasses are basal plates, though. No. no. So no. Not the, the and yeah, so a lot of the grasses also change their behaviour on how they're managed. Mm -hmm. So the one that I, I always talk about is weeping grass or microlina. It'll be a rhizome, you know, runner grass, a runner grass until you start giving it recovery and the right amount of animal impact and stock density. And it changes its shape. Do you know, down south, if we over mow a lawn that's got paspalum in it, the paspalum lays itself flat and starts sending its leaves and seed heads flat so they don't get chewed. If you start giving it the right amount of recovery and management, it'll stand up and become a bunch grass again. So not all grasses do that, but a lot of the grasses that we're thinking of as being runner grasses, actually a bunch grass is trying to get away. So they're trying to get away from the animals. So they. Another one that some form a ball, like a hedgy thing. So, you know, it's that sort of behaviour that when they're not being, we want them to express themselves. And so they're fully expressive as bunch grasses. So, yeah, this is about bunch grasses, Kerry. This is really important, decomposition of the litter. You need to know that it's the decomposition that actually drives the nutrient cycle. So at the same sort of surface roughness, you can tell I was a, wasn't a great scientist, but I can explain things. <laughs> At the same soil surface roughness, about 50% of your nutrient cycling comes from the decomposition of the litter and the basal cover of the perennial grass. So if you want to drive your nutrient cycle, you've got to have decomposing litter and large basal area. So in when I'm giving a regen ag talk, I say this decomposing litter is the common link between all the regenerative practices. You need to know what that looks like. So a slight decomposition is when it's going brown and it's turning and looking like compost and getting small, smaller pieces. So that's slight decomposition. Moderate decomposition in this scoring in landscape function is when it's got visible fungal attack. 
So if you think about sort of a compost heap or a really healthy forest or bush, if you pull the litter apart, you'll see visible fungal attack. So that's moderate decomposition and the nutrient cycle kicks up quite a lot when you go to moderate decomposition. So when David Tongwei was training me, he said he'd never seen moderate decomposition in a grassland, that it was only in forests and longer lived litter and things. So I, because um, I have, you know, so I, what I did was I'd go out and started measuring and found some. So I took a photo and sent it to him and said, oh, David, I feel like I may have misidentified this. So, like, you know, and you know, he, he came back because he's really sort of, um, he's really sincere and, you know, and passionate and stuff. So the first one, he comes back and answers me properly. I sent another one and he said, that'll do. <laughs> you know, like, I go, he's got me. <laughs> you know, like, you know, so he'd never seen it. So this is important. He had never seen it because the majority of the land is not managed for decomposition of the litter. And it's, that's what we're not doing. This is an active step. You must focus and do it. This just doesn't happen because you've changed your mindset. This happens because you actively go out and make it happen. So when I work with people, I've got to, I get them to do it on a small area. Then I get them to do it on a paddock scale. Then they spread it from there and work it out. I've found that if I train people how to do it in a small area, they're not asking me how high should they have the electric wire. They go ahead and do it. They're motivated. They know that they can do it on their land with their animals and that changes people. So there's like a double loop learning where people actually go, oh, I get it. You know, and then they've learnt about you know, decomposition of the litter and stock density and utilisation and recoveries and all those relationships. But there's also, oh, I found the enemy and the enemy is me. So what I do, people will ring me up and say, can you come and visit the farm? I've got a problem with this weed. I go, put in a safe to fail trial and I'll come in six months. And they ring me back at the end of six months and say, you don't need to come now. Because they've solved it for themselves. And that's different. I don't think we've got time to dilly-dally. I think we've got to get on. 